Ladies and gentlemen, today I am joined by Ford Fisher of News to Share. He is working on a documentary, Transhuman Biohackers and Immortalists, a topic that is really near and dear to my heart and one that I think the Libertarian Party and the Libertarian movement in general needs to be a lot more aware of because the changes that, that we're facing as a society, especially around transhumanism, are really critical to understanding how politics and social dynamics are changing. Really, it's not some far off thing. This is going to happen within our lifetimes. We're going to see this definitely while government is still relevant in our lives, unfortunately. So, uh, Ford, someone I've known cause since he first interviewed me for News to Share back in 2014. So he's right. been in this game for a few years now. It's really exciting to be able to, to have seen how you have grown in your activism and in your news coverage and everything that you're able to do covering activism. But, but now, taking it to the next level, adding this documentary project to your plate, what was the impetus for that, Ford? Yeah, so I've always been interested in covering people who are interested in making change. So in 2014, you were trying to make change. Whether it worked or not, you were attempting to uh, restore some gun rights to this country. Well, it did work. In D.C., they changed the policy. It's barely changed. <laughs> I live I live in D.C., and uh, I'm qualified to carry a gun in Virginia, uh, but I'm not even going to try to do the, the D.C. one. Well, thanks uh, thanks, thanks to you, thank, thanks to independent media that, 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 that right. carry that. We, we reach a lot of people. And, and, yeah. and I, 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 you, know, you know you play a big role in... in, in in amplifying activists' effort with what you do. Right, and so when you get that independent media out there, when you show it online, mainstream media can't ignore it. And so, like in the case of that situation, we ended up getting that on CNN, and that was actually one of the first projects I had done, and it kind of combined a lot of the, the things I'm interested in, activism, libertarianism, film, media, et cetera. So, uh, the transhumanist movement is very much behind the scenes. They're not very loud, there's not a whole lot of protesting, there's not a whole lot of political lobbying, but it's very difficult for people who are interested in practicing something about altering the body uh, in the current regulatory state, right? So people who want to uh, create some kind of gene editing uh, experiment, people who want to inject uh, microchips into their body for whatever reason, people who want to turn themselves into cyborgs somehow, uh, the FDA is not particularly fond of people taking that sort of stuff into their own hands. And so this has become very much a gray and black market uh, sort of situation. and. It's difficult because uh, many of them could be prosecuted or people who are actually uh, doctors involved in this stuff uh, could lose their medical licenses. Because it would be like practicing medicine without a license to do a, something that isn't legally yet classified as medicine? Where, where, where are they really trying to get people on that? Right, so uh, to give a good example, um, I filmed uh, the ground zero kind of experiment of uh, an individual named uh, Tristan Roberts had HIV or has HIV and uh, another person named Aaron Trawick uh, developed what he believed would be an HIV cure. And it was a gene editing uh, cure that basically would attempt to splice genes from somebody who naturally has a resistance to HIV uh, and put it into Tristan's body. And well, hold on, I gotta point out, yes. the, the cool thing about that is that that also becomes a global cure for AIDS, right, or for HIV, yeah. if, if everybody was able to get that. If successful, it would, and Aaron's vision actually with that was that he wanted to, uh, if he could prove that it worked, he actually wanted to put it on the blockchain so that nobody could ever uh, censor it, so that no government could deem it illegal and then make it go away, so that no corporation could say, we own a patent on this and you've got to pay $50,000 per dose or something like that. He wanted to prove that it would work and then just make it available for everybody so that it could be simulated. It took him $5,000 to make it. He figured once one of these actually works, maybe we could put the, these schematics out there and someone could cure themselves of, of AIDS or HIV for five thousand dollars in any event uh, yeah that's a good deal right. i mean what i mean you, what do people right, pay right for now. hiv management at this point vastly more than that and because we have an insurance system that um makes it kind of complicated where people don't exactly feel the cost of what they're doing everything is more expensive subsidies make it more expensive um and because the cost is hidden from the main user of it everybody pays more in insurance fees and nobody feels the exact uh, price of their medication. In any event, when I live streamed uh, this experiment happened, uh, Aaron, who developed it, had to describe it as, I'm giving it to him as a research compound only, and it's not medication. And so uh, it's not illegal because I'm just giving it to him as a researcher. This is just a chemical I've concocted, and he is free to do with it whatever he wants to. So Tristan, this HIV patient, had to inject it into his own body. It the FDA could theoretically have the developer of this arrested if he injected it into the other person. 
Right. Or, or even if potentially he provided supervision or treatment or anything else around right. it. And so it was treading a line, and they always had plans actually on what they would do if uh, if any of them ended up being arrested for it. Right? They had backup plans of where to store files and things like that to make sure uh, that the stuff couldn't be hidden. But what was interesting was the video ended up being used uh, on BBC not too long later, and once there was a story. Uh, about this, the FDA actually put out a memo specifically warning against unlicensed uh, experimental uh, uh, gene editing therapies. And so the FDA uh, tends to try to get its hands into everything. They want to regulate every single piece of, of transhumanist experimentation, medical experimentation. Well, and I got to put yeah. the FDA in context. Sure. And, and if you haven't seen the interview we did uh, relatively recently from the Texas State LP convention with Dr. Mary Ruert, who wrote the book Death by Regulation, uh, not only has she demonstrated academically that the FDA has been responsible for tens of millions of deaths from allowing unsafe drugs to go to market and keeping life-saving drugs off the market for periods of time or even indefinitely. Uh, but the way she's been putting it into to terms now, the FDA has been responsible for taking at least five years off the lifespan of the average American. This is not an entity that has your best interest at heart, obviously. Right, and so uh, whether or not this experiment would have worked, the point was that the FDA actively tries to discourage that kind of thing. And so he ended up developing this for $5,000, but if he was to try to go through the regulatory hurdles necessary to just give this to somebody, it requires all kinds of clinical trials, all kinds of fees, and it would end up being millions of dollars. So we could have the next Albert Einstein alive right now, uh, and because he doesn't have billions of dollars or you know venture capital and stuff, he's not allowed to work on it legally. And so that's why now we have this kind of gray market for transhumanist activity occurring. Uh, Aaron actually died a couple of months ago, uh, the person who developed it, unfortunately. Uh, and there's no conspiracy <laughs> here. Uh, he, he passed away. Um, he actually drowned in a uh, meditation tank, um, unfortunately. And there's a whole story. I have a hard time believing you can I, say that someone drowned in a meditation tank and you can he, say for certain yes, that there's uh, no chance of any foul play. Right. Well, so, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to let people, if anybody wants to Google him, his name's Aaron Trawick, and you can read about that situation online because it's, it's not exactly the, um, uh, it's not as relevant to the experiment that he was actually sure. doing. Um, but in any event, so that kind of medicine is being practiced by all kinds of people around the world, and they're doing it outside of the scope of, of the state. And so there's a, com there's a competition happening where people want to get outside of the institutions academic institutions, state institutions, uh, or government-sponsored corporations. So to sum it up, would it be fair to say that the purpose of this documentary is to make these ideas familiar enough with people and, and make people comfortable with them in order to make sure that people's rights in this realm are respected by government? Well, yes, and we need to start talking about these issues because I think a lot of people aren't even aware that this kind of movement exists. And so when you have a new movement or a new situation or a new problem uh, to apply into current politics, Different politicians can kind of rush to get into it, right? If, if the Democrats found transhumanism and decided to add it as a party plank, you might end up with a bunch of people who are kind of apolitical scientists who end up turning into Democrats. Uh, so I think it's really important that we kind of guide it. I'm not necessarily trying to advocate for transhumanism or even necessarily advocate for libertarianism and transhumanism, but I think that it is important for people to start talking about these ideas and thinking about it. Other types of consequences or issues that people think about is if someone is injecting uh, a microchip into their body, uh, what is a third party, like a corporation or a state, allowed to do to it, right? If a government wants to uh, find out if your heart's beating some certain rate because the pacemaker is attached to something, uh, should the Fourth Amendment protect that? I, I would say probably, and I've interviewed people who would say so, but uh, those sorts of rights aren't exactly uh, written out yet and there's a whole lot of um of different situations that we can start thinking about in terms of the rights of the individual in their body All right, so speaking of which you wanted to read the cyborg right. bill of rights and i hear this and i go what wait a second and i mean i'm i'm excited about this technology i'm a huge i think this right. is this is this is human evolution just accelerating in, in in so many exciting ways and whatever this like next wave of transhumanism in the next maybe first wave you could call it of the next 10 years remember the one of the next 10 years is going to be not just the same thing again it's going to be the same thing on another scale and and that's really exciting but i've i've given this some thought and it's like well no the the, the rights come have to come from being like an independent will and everything that's 
you know, programmed is, is, is representative of the will of a human behind it. But you're talking about cyborgs as this intermediary. Why do they need a special bill of rights? Well, it can be difficult because you have to ask the question, once you put something inside of you, is it you, right? There was actually a really great movie called uh, Repo in which uh, people were basically taking out loans to get um, uh, transplant, organ transplants put in. And then if they didn't pay for it, right, it was this brutal, disgusting kind of horror movie where then the insurance company would come and like rip your heart out and sell it to somebody else, that kind of thing. So uh, I would imagine that that would be kind of a dystopian situation. We probably want to try to avoid that, but we have to start thinking. Yeah, about not ripping people's hearts out would right, be, it would be a good, bad. good mark of civilization. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's room for debate on some of these issues, but ripping out hearts, definitely bad. <laughs> Um, so one individual did write up uh, what they believe uh, should be the Cyborg Bill of Rights, um, and they include freedom from disassembly, and it's the, uh, that a person should enjoy the sanctity of bodily integrity and be free from unnecessary search, seizure, seizure suspension, or interruption of function, detachment, dismantling, or disassembly without due process. Now, this, is, this is really cool. Coming from a voluntarist libertarian perspective, like, right. you know, you own yourself, you own your body, but I often think, well, is it, is, it, is it even me? Like, is my hair, if I pull out a hair, does, is it, you know, is detached yeah, you from my, physically detached from my will? If I cut my, you know, my fingernails, they're, they're part of me, but when I clip them, I throw them away. And, and, and now with transhumanism, it's like we're, we're for the first time really reversing that process. Although you could say with many surgical things in the last couple of decades, at least we've been able to do this in, in smaller degrees. But this is a really cool assertion You're saying that if someone incorporates no matter what it is a piece of machinery with their body you have to treat it with the same respect as if it was part of your organic body right right and in the context of the world that we have now where we have a state and we have due process rights uh that should apply to the same thing so if somebody has some kind of perhaps a microchip in their brain that embedded in it has memories or something whatever it is uh you would want somehow to lay out what rights that includes uh, as far as search or seizure. The government shouldn't be able to rip out your implant, right. And, right? But right now, the government uh, asserts their right to fingerprint you if you're arrested, right? So the rights of somebody with something inside of their body would need to be laid out. So and if you got arrested with something as part of your body that made it challenging for the government to keep you incarcerated, like, I mean, what if I, you know, get my hand cut off or just don't get it cut off and just want to replace it with, like, I don't know, nuclear laser cannon, you know, something right. like that, this, with a shoulder thing that pops up and, and you know... You know, a really big clip in it. You know, if I'm if I go to jail and I, I, I they're going to have to disassemble me in order to incarcerate me, right? So this is this. I, I mean, I know this. It's kind of a silly example, but it it does uh, have some relevance. The the film uh, Upgrade that recently came out uh, actually had featured a character who had embedded a like a shotgun like into his arm, <laughs> right? So I mean, not saying that that's necessarily practical. A man after my own heart. <laughs> Right, but uh, yeah, you could have gone to DC and loaded your arm and said, <laughs> we, won't, we won't be silent, we won't obey. Um, in any event, uh, <laughs> we're, we're still at the convention, so there's some, uh, some louder people here. But the next one is freedom of morphology, right? So morphological freedom is kind of the transhumanist equivalent of, of the non-aggression principle. And uh, that idea is that a person shall be free to express themselves through temporary or permanent ad adaptations alterations, modifications, or augmentations to shape or form their bodies. Similarly, a person shall be free from coerced or otherwise involuntary morphological changes. So simply put, if someone wants to put a microchip in their body and they're not forcing anyone else's involvement, they're not making someone else pay for it, uh, that they should be able to put whatever they want into their own body, manipulate their body uh, however, however they want. Someone can turn into whatever they want as long as they don't hurt anyone else or force anyone else to do it. Uh, maybe even more importantly, though, is the second part of that, that they should be free from coerced involuntary morphological changes, right? That uh, if the government decided, we really feel like everyone should have a microchip, it'll just make it easier, right? We have driver's licenses, why don't we just chip everybody? Uh, that that would be an involuntary uh, modification. And this actually has a practical example. In Australia, there was a case uh, there's a guy whose legal name is Meow Disco Ludo Meow Meow. That is legally his name. Uh, you can ask him why, but uh, in any event, so I, I interviewed him uh, in Texas at a transhumanist convention, but he had a case going and then he recently lost and then won on appeal, where in Australia they have uh, bus cards, right, that have little microchips uh, in the card and that's how you scan to get on the bus. And he decided as an experiment 
I'm going to put this thing into my hand. He turned it in, he took away the card and kept the chip and he put that into his hand and he managed to get on the bus, put his hand up to the bus and, and it paid. So he was able to enter. And then he calls up all the news and says, check out this thing I did. The news calls, uh, called the, the government of Australia for comment and the government says, we totally don't endorse this happening to our products and we think that the uh, chip is the property of the state. And so luckily, Meow well, hold on, to be fair, the state thinks everything is the property of the state within yeah, its yes, territory, exactly. right? Uh, exactly. But so in, the, in this case, they claim that the, that the card itself is the property of the state. And uh, Meow actually used a temporary card, right? You can buy one at a convenience store rather than using the one registered to your name. The next time he gets on the bus and tries to use the one that is registered to his name, it didn't work. So the government of Australia, thinking that he had put the one in his hand that was attached to his name, uh, shut down the card. So there's, a, so there's a real question here. Did the government assault him? Did they, they, they failed, but did they attempt to stop something that was functioning inside of his body wow. when they did that? Wow. Now, I gotta say, that's what you get for putting the government in your body. Why would you ever right. do that in the first place? But uh, <laughs> governments, <laughs> I'm, I'm so statist, I'm mainlining here. Right. But yeah, no, but obviously he's just trying to ride a bus where the government has a monopoly. And it's, it's really yeah, a I mean, it was, sad it was, case. It was scientific uh, political trolling in a way. Yeah. But, but it has real precedent setting implications. The government ended up uh, charging him with not riding the bus with a valid bus card. They tried to claim that he had, uh, basically they charged him under the statute that would get some Invalidated his, oh really? Because he wasn't trying to avoid the fare, he, he was paying. Successfully was trying to pay. And he modified the device by putting his body and right. was still able to use it to pay. Uh, Ori originally- What's the matter government, you don't want my money? <laughs> right, originally the government uh, succeeded in finding him guilty and then he appealed and the judge ruled that he could have been charged and the judge would have found him guilty for tampering with the card since it's the government's, but since he had been charged with fair evasion and he tried to pay, that uh, she found him not guilty on appeal. But these are the kinds of issues that we're talking about here. It could happen, right? Th these are not kind of abstractions. It's not just science fiction, right? Eventually people will have a lot more medical implants um, with, with government being involved in healthcare, it's not hard to imagine that the government could claim to own as property something that ends up in your body uh, for someone who actually really needs it. What no, if the state yeah. owned your pacemaker? Yeah. No, this is, this is really exciting for the, in, in the course of human development to, to see that, uh, that, that there's a, a, a movement that is about human empowerment fundamentally with technology that it raises these fundamental issues about self-ownership. It's like, as libertarians, we've been talking about this for a long time, but when it's, hey, do you want to something? Do you want to make your body work better? Well, because government doesn't respect your self-ownership, that's why it's in the way. And if we just asserted self-ownership, you would have, like, this wouldn't be necessary. Am I, I mean, am I, is it correct to say that if we, if we had a world that respected self-ownership and property rights, that, that the Cyborg Bill of Rights wouldn't be necessary? Uh Probably, but there are also some more complicated uh, aspects. So we're, we did two out of five of them, and I, I'll okay. try to be quicker. But so well, let's just mention them real fast, and then hear where you're at so with this documentary. Well, yeah. So so one of them basically involves that if something is inside of your body, then it that it belongs to you. But particularly in reference to the fact that a corporation could sell you something and put it into you, right? So does that thing become yours? And they call that the right to organic naturalization. Then they have the right to uh, bodily sovereignty, which says that you are the supremacist of anything that is inside of you. And lastly, equality for mutants, that if somebody changes themselves uh, and they are somehow less human, if someone somehow manages to turn themselves into a bird, <laughs> uh, if someone manages to put their brain into something else and now they're a robot and not a human anymore, that they should still be entitled to all of the rights that they would be otherwise. Uh, now that man doesn't lose his <laughs> firearms. <laughs> now, now that's really cool because you know, it, it's something that's that's you know really important to understanding self ownership in this message and and you know what is it that qualifies us for having rights for having those rights respected? It can't be because you're human because if an alien came down and you know you wouldn't say well you're not human so right, we don't we believe should, in yourself. We should, we, Away. Yeah. Exactly. Of course, we're going to respect the self ownership of anything that at least meets the the intellectual criteria. And so, asserting that and raising that issue in a relevant way that's that's really exciting. So, again, what's the document documentary project, and where are you at with it right now? Right. So the film is called Transhuman uh, Colon Biohackers and Immun. Uh, the, sorry, Transhuman Biohackers and Immortalists. Uh, I actually sold a half hour TV version of it to One American News Network. Uh, it didn't end up airing, but. Um, 
I'm still working on kind of a longer 90 minute version of it that's going to go through uh, some of the scientific experiments that I've filmed uh, as well as kind of the political issues surrounding it. I've spoken to a lot of philosophers, uh, uh, professors, all kinds of different activists, all kinds of different people with different uh, opinions on how we should go forward kind of into this new world. And again, the point of it isn't to necessarily advocate for transhumanism or advocate for a specific position, but to say we need to start talking about this uh, because it's coming one way or another and we probably want society to guide it in a way that, that leans in the direction of freedom. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for it. Any websites or anything else you want to plug today? Yeah, so my website is called News to Share. It's News the Number to Share. Uh, my name is Ford Fisher. I also have a Patreon. Uh, I know that you, you seem to hop from your Patreon. Uh, now you're doing more Steam It type stuff. But um, I also have a Steam It. I'm kind of dipping my toes into, into a little bit of everything. So Steam It, uh, I, you, you can also find me at News to Share. But Patreon is patreon.com oh, slash Ford Fisher. Steam It.com slash at News to Share. And the Patreon is? Uh, Patreon.com slash Ford Fisher. And I also have a D-Tube, uh, although I don't know what the URL is. Fisher with a C, right? Yes, F-I-S-C-H-E-R. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ford. Really appreciate yeah. your time today.